Amen. I want to preach to you today from 2 Kings chapter 4, a little Old Testament. Now, I am a black preacher. Y'all, y'all used to that? Uh-huh. Uh, but I'm old school. Come on, I'm going to make you talk to your neighbor. If I, you know, I, I'll, I'll do a Jericho march around this pulpit right now. I got a B3 in the back just in case we need to roll it out. Come on, somebody who do an old school church. I'm joking. But it says this. It says, one day, the widow of the member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out, My husband who served you is dead, and you know that he feared the Lord, but now a creditor has come, threatening to take my two sons as slaves. What can I do to help you, Elisha said. And this is the key phrase in this verse. Tell me, what do you have in the house? She says, nothing at all except a flask of olive oil, she replied. And Elisha said, okay, I can work with that. Borrow as many empty jars, borrow as many empty vessels, borrow as many empty containers, borrow as many empty people as you can. Your friends and your neighbors. Then go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour olive oil from your flask into the jars setting each one aside when it is filled. So she did as she was told. Her sons kept bringing her jar after jar, filled, and she filled one after another. Soon, every container was full to the brim. Bring me another jar, she said to one of her sons. There aren't any more, he told her. And then the oil stopped flowing. When she told the man of God what had happened, he said to her, now sell the olive oil and pay your debts. And you and your sons can live off of what is left over. What we find in this scripture is how to find favor in famine. What we can see in our text here is there's a woman who is in a season of not enough. But because God sends a word by her house, she moves from not enough to more than enough. There's a woman in here, this passage of Scripture, who who is on the verge of probably losing her mind. You see, her husband has died. Her husband was a prophet. He was of the company of prophets. And so her husband would represent her status in the community. Her husband would represent her connection to God. Her husband would represent her provision, her security, her protection, her hope, her future. And the Bible says that he died. We don't know what he died from or of. But as I preached this message and I read the scripture, I I came to understand that there are many people in the body of Christ that are in famine season because a dream has died. Because they're between their prayer and their promise. Because they are stuck in the middle of somewhere. Maybe we feel like the woman with the issue of blood where we, we, we've got issues and we're trying to, to get this thing healed and delivered and we've spent all that we've had. Somebody in the body of Christ is spent. Don't know if I can take it anymore. Don't have the strength I used to have. I'm in church and I tithe and I give and I pray, but I'm still feel like I'm stuck on, on, on the side of shoulda, coulda, woulda. I'm living in regret. This woman, her husband, he's died. Now she's confronted with not just losing her husband, but also losing her sons. The Bible says the creditor is coming. Now, it's important for you to understand the context of this passage of Scripture. This is a Hebrew law is that when the husband dies and he dies with debt, that debt now gets passed on to the next generation. So his sons are now indebted to the creditor. They don't belong to the mama. They belong to the creditor. Uh Uh-huh. Are y'all with me? They seem like they're free, but they're not free. Because they belong to the creditor. A lot of church, I came to tell you 
that there is a real life creditor today. The enemy, the accuser, the devil, and he is after the next generation. The creditor has come. He's after our children. He's after their identity. He's coming through subtle messages where they just, our generation behind us just starts accepting average as their normal. The creditor is coming. Robbing them of their purpose and their destiny and their future. But this woman, she shows us how to break the cycle that has been passed down from generation to generation. Pastor, what are you talking about? What I'm talking about is strongholds. What I'm talking about is generational strongholds and generational cycles. And my great-granddaddy did it. And my granddaddy did it. And my dad struggled with it. And now I am struggling with it. It could be the cycle of addiction. It could be the cycle of insecurity. It could be the cycle of fear. It could be the cycle of doubt. It could be the cycle of being broke. But I believe that God is raising up a generation that says it stops with me. I'm not passing this down to my children. And let me tell you something, Alive Church, if you're not going to do it for yourself, do it for the seed that's coming behind you. It is time to break the cycle of addiction off of the next, I feel like preaching today. It is time to break the cycle of fear, to break the cycle of diabetes, to break the cycle of sickness, to break the cycle of poverty. Okay, I had to make sure I was in the right place because I feel like preaching today. Somebody's got to wake up with enough is enough. Enemy, you have been tormenting me too long. You've been messing with my children too long. The Bible says that the kingdom of God suffered violent and the violent take it by force. It is time for the body of Christ to stop being punk Christians. And to go to war, to break strongholds. You cannot break a stronghold with a strong effort. You got to get in the spirit. You got to take worship outside of the, of the church house and bring it to your house. You got to learn how to pray when no one else is praying and worship when there is no band and worship when there is no keyboard. Worship ain't about lyrics. It's about lifestyle. Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you would offer your body as a living sacrifice. I'm fired up because the enemy has been messing with my kids too long. Uh Uh-huh. I'm fired up because, come on, there's a generation of young people that are struggling with their identity. And I came to tell you, holiness is still cool. The blood of Jesus still covers sins. There are some people who are going to walk in the freeing power of Jesus Christ to say enough is enough. Ain't even messing with you, keeping you up late at night, keeping you in shame. That's why you got to start testifying, even when you're walking through, when you ain't all the way there yet. Come on, somebody. Uh, uh, I'm going to start faking it before I make it. No, no, I'm going to start talking about it before I walk in it. Uh Uh-huh. I am the righteousness of God. No weapon formed against me is going to prosper. I am the head and not the tail. I am above and not beneath. I am first and I'm not greater as he that is in me. Uh, Come on. You can have anxiety and be anointed at the same time. I ain't playing today, y'all. This woman, she, she should be depressed. But she has a destiny. She should be complaining, but she's praying. Mm -hmm. She should be thinking about herself, but she's thinking about others. What? 
Could it be today that God wants to move you from famine to favor? But he's waiting, watch this now, for your language to change. She should have said, God, my husband is dead. I don't know how I'm going to pay these bills. You want me to tithe? You want me to become a part of, uh, uh, of 200 people becoming to, faithful to this house? You, you, you. She should have been complaining. I ain't got nothing to eat. My friends have left me and forsaken me. I feel betrayed. God knows your family is jacked up alive, church. He knows. Come on, somebody. Stop telling him everything he already knows. And he's waiting for you to know what he knows. He's wait. Come on, somebody. He's waiting for you to speak those things that be not as if they all ready are. Oh, my husband is amazing. My wife is amazing. My kids, even though they're bad, guess what? They're walking in favor and destiny and purpose. You got to learn how to speak something when you don't feel it. Uh. She, 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 she finds a word. She, she, in the midst of her pain, she, God sends Elisha by her house. Uh, woo! In the midst of her worry, she has a word come by her way. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? In the midst of her pain, come on, somebody, something prophetic gets erupted. Come on, somebody. In the midst of her, of, of her misery, come on, somebody, she, she, she's on the verge of a miracle. So Elisha comes by her house and says, what do you have in your house? She says, I got two sons that are indebted to the enemy. There's something amazing about this house. There's something amazing about this house. There's something amazing about your house. Do you realize when God speaks a word over the church house, it encompasses your house. Uh, 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 I don't think y'all get it all the time. If God says we're going to another level as the church house, that means your house has to go to another level. I'm trying, let me help y'all. I have learned a secret. I used to be in long services where the prophet would come in. I'm talking about old school church. And he would declare a word and he would call, if that's you, and somebody would stand up and say, yeah, that's me. And it was amazing. I knew how to steal somebody else's word. <laughs> Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? Y'all, I'd be like, that's me. Come on, come on. You got to learn when God speaks a word over this house, it's for my house too. My house walking in freedom. My house walking in favor. My house is walking in deliverance. That word is for me. Somebody say it's for me too. Come on, look at the person next to you and says, even you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was so special about this house? Number one, if you're taking notes, this house is a house that serves. This woman Part of the equation from moving her from famine to favor is she served even while she was suffering. What you mean? Serve while I'm suffering? Pastor, you done lost, you done bumped your head. You mean show up and volunteer on my only day off? Uh, uh, how many of y'all have said this? I can't serve. I can't partner and member with the church because I ain't all the way there yet. Come on, where y'all at? Where y'all at yet? Come on, come on, come on, go with me. Come on, just, uh, come on, I'll turn my back. Go ahead, raise your hand. If I drop my iPad right now and shatter the glass, which I have, would I pick it up and say, I can't take it to the repair shop until I fix it first. I wouldn't say that. So why do you think you have to fix you 
when God just wants to use you. Let me preach this for a second. God does not want your opinion of you. He just wants your obedience from you. Come on, somebody. I'm about to serve the purposes of God even while I'm suffering. God is going to move me from famine to favor. I, I learned something years ago. I had back surgery. I, I had a, a, a tour. No, not, I had not tour. I had a, a slip disc. Two of them on my back. It was so bad I would crawl. Crawl to the bathroom in the middle of the night. The back was awful. I had to take this medicine and get shots and the whole deal. And I decided to have surgery. And I had back surgery. And when I had this back surgery, the doctor said something that I'll never forget. He said, oftentimes, the pain of recovery is greater than the pain of the injury. And he said, but understand, God is healing you if you feel it. Uh-huh. But many of us have been taking too many painkillers, like alcohol. Come on, somebody. Like relationships we shouldn't be in, like conversations we shouldn't have. Could it be that God wants it to hurt so he can heal it? Come on, somebody. And so I had back surgery, Pastor Tabitha, and I woke up from back surgery, and I had the ugliest nurse you ever want to see in your life. Y'all, she had about a four-inch mole, and hairs were coming out of it, and her, ner- her name badge said Nurse Betty. I had just gotten a six-inch cut down the middle of my back. And Nurse Betty had the audacity to tell me that I had to get up and walk. I said, I just got cut. She says, I understand. But if you keep laying there, it won't be the injury that keeps you there. It'll be the collateral damage from you laying down and not getting back up. And Nurse Betty grabbed my hand, and she said, boy, you're going to get up out that bed. And then Nurse Betty, I don't know if she's saved, sanctified, or redeemed, but she said, you are going to get healed as you go. I came all the way to Orlando to triple dog dare you to get your hands and serve him. And God says, you are going to get healed as you go. You may not feel it, but I am the righteousness of God. I dare you to get up from the place that you have been laying and said, God, bless me as I go. God, redeem me as I go. God, forgive me as I go. God, give me favor as I go. From famine to favor. This woman is the epitome of from famine to favor. She she never made it about herself. Everybody do your hands like this. Some of y'all hands ashy right now. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Look like you've been juggling powdered donuts. Just, just. <laughs> this is the posture that God wants us in, even in famine. God, I'm here to serve the purposes of God. God, whatever you put in my hands, I'm going to hold it loosely because it doesn't belong to me anyway. I'm going to be known for what I give away, not for what I keep. Uh huh. A lot of church, I have come to understand, watch this now. Are y'all ready? That if you live your life open-handed, God will keep your hands full. Woo! Come on, somebody. If it's Sunday, I'll serve. If it's Monday, I'll serve. Come on, somebody. If it cost me my only day off, I'll serve. The Bible says this in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. It talks about this guy who's like the prototype of serving. His name is Jesus. He says, Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. Jesus did not come to be served. The king of kings came to serve. The Lord of Lords came to serve. The one sitting at the right hand of the Father came to serve. He came to give his life. He he, he wasn't looking for benefits. He didn't have an entitlement issue. Everybody under 30. 
We got to break this entitlement issue off of y'all. Come on, I came as a father today. I'm 48 years old. I say what I want to say. We got to have this mentality that this is a privilege for me to do. It's not my right. It's my privilege. I get to do this. I get to be a part of what God is doing. I get to team up with God to change the world. I, I love those Liam Neeson movies. You know what I'm talking about? You know, always somebody getting kidnapped. And they go overseas. I'm like, y'all know the plot because it's the same plot every movie. And you're waiting for the call. The guy's going to make the call. And he's going to ask for ransom. And when he asks for ransom, the person who's going after is trying to get all the money together to release the debt of the person who's captured or to pay the debt. That's ransom. Are y'all with me? In the kingdom of God, the currency of the kingdom is not finances. The currency of the kingdom is faith. It doesn't say finances without works is dead. It says faith without works is dead. The currency of earth is finances. When you serve, you get up. Graded. Come on, somebody. God downloads in your spiritual account a level of faith that sets the captives free. You giving somebody bread and water, they're getting the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. When you serve, things change. My daughter once asked me when she was younger, Daddy, does the church have a bank account? I said, Yeah. She goes, does God have a bank account? She didn't understand the whole tithing, giving thing. And I said, yeah. She goes, well, what's God's bank account? I said, the church. She says, what do you mean? I says, honey, I want to teach you this principle. When you give to the church, it changes lives. And I said, if I could give a dollar and trace how that dollar is a part of those two million people, those 40 people that got saved last week, what you sowed keeps the anointing to flow. Are y'all with me? So, so number one, how she moves from famine to favor is this house serves. But watch number two. This house is anointed. Somebody say this house is anointed. Second Kings 4, 2, what, what can I do to help you, Elisha says? Tell me what. Do you have in your house? She says, all I got is a little Crisco. A little extra virgin olive oil. A little Pompeii. See, y'all, when I grew up, we ain't had fancy oil. We had leftover chicken grease. I was anointed but still attracted bugs everywhere I went. I was so on the enemy's side. I was jacked up. I was lost as a teenager. And my mama would anoint every facet of my room. And when, however long I was gone, when I came back, I came back to a place that was saturated. And she would speak over me. When I was asleep, one day you're going to preach the gospel. One day you're going to preach and people are going to get saved. One day people are going to come to the freeing power of Jesus Christ. One day you're going to realize you are anointed. And I remember that day that I just started to see, maybe, I, maybe I, God has have a call on my life. Maybe God can use me despite my dyslexia, despite my learning disabilities, despite the fact that I can't read unless I'm reading scripture. Maybe God will use a Bible college dropout. Maybe God can use somebody for years who struggled with a pornography addiction. Maybe. And some of you feel like, I don't have oil. Yes, you do. You've got a little bit left. Come on, somebody. This woman said, all I have is this little bit 
of oil. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, the anointing oil is God's authorship. The anointing oil is God's authority. The anointing oil, it come on somebody, it generates the ability to do things that you couldn't do. The Bible says that when Samuel anointed David, David was anointed from that day forward. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. That anointed already conquered Goliath, even though the battle wouldn't come for 10 years later. I'm telling you, somebody got to hold on to your anointing. Hold on to it. What you feel right now, that conviction, it's the anointing. It ain't goosebumps. It's not cold. It's the anointing. It's God saying, I set you apart. That's what God told Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1.5. He says, I have anointed you, and I have set you apart for service. Let me make this plain. What I have prayed over my life is if, if I'm not supposed, if my anointing is not supposed to be there, then I'm not supposed to be there. Are y'all with me? I'm, I prayed a, da- a dangerous prayer, and I'm going to tell y'all about that. I think you should pray. I said, God, everything that I'm not supposed to do, everywhere that I'm not supposed to go, anyone that I'm not supposed to be around, let my anointing make it not work. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I'm telling y'all right now, it's not a closed door. It's God's protection. Some of y'all think that God jacked you up and he don't love you anymore. No, he loves you enough not to, let, not to keep allowing you to make the mistakes you are making so you can hold on to a little bit of oil. This woman says, I don't have a husband. I don't have food in the cupboards. I don't have a church. There is no band at home. But what I got is a little bit of oil. Is there anybody at a live church that can hold on to a little bit of oil? I'm talking about the kind of oil where you ain't got to wait till you get to church to pray. You can lay hands on your own kids and say, healing, you shall be healed. You shall be anointed. This thing is about to change. What do you do when you can't take the worship band to work? (laughs) You put a song inside of here. Come on, you can be at your computer. Gyra, you are enough with these crazy people. Gyra, you are enough even though I don't want to forgive them. Gyra, you are enough even though my paycheck wasn't what it was supposed to be. Gyra, you are enough even though my family pissed me off again. Gyra, you, you got to learn how to hold on to your anointing. When the doctor gives you a diagnosis, Gyra, you are enough. Come on, somebody. When you're angry, Gyra, you are enough. He says, all I got is this little bit of oil. Y'all, are any of y'all like chicken? I'm talking about wings. I'm not talking about wings. I'm talking about wings. There's this place in, in Maryland before I moved. It's called Jim's Hideaway, but I found it. And they had the most anointed, amazing, God-sent chicken wings and sweet tea on the planet. You had me a sweet tea. Some of y'all are like, yeah, 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 yeah. I get what you're saying. They advertise these wings. They, if you go to Yelp right now, It'll be the best wings on the planet. Found out about it. Told my wife, let's go on a date night. Don't get dressed up because it's going to get messy. (laughs) We went out. Went to Jim's hideaway. Come on, somebody. I went around and opened the door for her. I never never do that just because we was at Wings Place. I was happy. We go in. I sit down. Little waitress come over. She's like, what y'all want? I'm like, duh. She don't ask me what I want. I want sweet tea. I want the wings that have been marinated overnight. They have been smoked to perfection for 14 hours. I don't know, it just sounds good. And then they have been ever so slightly flash fried for the perfect crisp and then bathed in the anointing of that barbecue sauce with that vinegar base. That's what I want. And a side of collard greens, come on. She comes back, sir, sorry. (laughs) 
And I don't know about y'all, I got another language. Skew me. I start talking to fictitious people. Y'all, did y'all hear what she just said? My wife's like, honey, don't set it off. Remember who you are. She says, we ran out of wings. I was like, listen, lady, you advertise wings. They're on the menu. People reviewed the wings. Wings is on the sign. You sell wings. How in the world do you run out of wings? wings. And I started to think about a live church. You sell freedom. You sell joy. Don't you dare run out of the anointing. You sell deliverance. You, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. There are some people that are going to walk into this door and need a blessing and a word from God. I dare you to hold on to the anointing. Refuse to gossip. I dare you to hold on to the anointing. Refuse to make it about you, we cannot run out of the thing we advertise to set people free. This house, somebody said this house is anointed. I, I just want to do a little, a little survey. Has anybody, has, mar- has your marriage been restored because of something in this house? Come on, somebody. Uh-huh. Have you gotten your confidence? Come on, keep, I want to see hands. Have you gotten your confidence? Have you discovered your purpose? Have you felt the freeing power of Jesus Christ in this house? Oh, you know why? This house is anointed. I have decided that I would rather preach a bad sermon anointed than the perfect sermon without oil. I've decided I don't like to be ashy. Come on, somebody. We got too many preachers walking around ashy. We got too many worship leaders walking around ashy. No, dip me another time in the anointing. That worship y'all had in here this morning, that was powerful. It was powerful because the worship team went to a place that you haven't been to lead you there. Pastor, what are you talking about? We can't lead people to a place we haven't been already. You're anointed. The room shifted because of the anointing. What we need is the parking lot people anointed. What we need is the counters anointed. What we need is the sound people anointed. What we need to do is tithe anointed. What we need to do is give anointed. What we need to do is serve anointed. Number three, what's special about this house is this house, say this with me, say this house needs my house. Now watch the, the equation of this miracle. Second Kings 4, 3 and 4, and Elisha said, Go borrow. Somebody say borrow. As many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. Then go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour olive oil from your flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it is filled. Wow. Key word there is borrow. I I have no tools at my house. I'm not a handyman. I'm a preacher and a golfer. I'm good at that too. Beat anybody in here, just let you know. <laughs> Nothing to do with my sermon, just wanted to flex for a second. <laughs> so, I don't have tools, so a couple years ago I asked my friend, hey man, can I use your DeWalt, you know that yellow drill, power drill, I ain't had no power drill. I said, can I borrow it? He said, sure. So I borrowed it. Kept it. Don't ask me. Don't let me borrow, don't lend anything to me, y'all. I'm like, can I get five dollars? You're never seeing it again. I'm a horrible borrower. It's not even a word. About a year later, he said, Hey man, can I have my drill back? I said, What drill? It's my drill. I didn't, I had borrowed it so long ago, I didn't even remember. I thought it was mine. So I said, sure, you can have it back. And then I gave it back to him. It was jacked up, it was scratched. Battery was drained. I gave it back to him empty. The Bible says that this woman and these two sons had a passion. They had vision from the pastors that God's about to do a miracle in the house. The only thing we need to do is go borrow some empty vessels. Can you imagine them going to knock on doors? Hey, hey neighbors, uh, uh, listen, God is doing a miracle back at the house, but We need you. What do you need from me? You? What? 
I, I'm empty. That's the beauty of this. He's not looking for anything full. He's looking for a vessel that ain't got it all together. He goes to the single mom and says, listen, I, I know your husband left you, and I know he broke covenant, and I know your, your life has been, you know, all over the place since that happened. But can you come and be a part of this house and moving us from famine to favor? Can we use your vessel? Some of you right now are on the verge of, I'm not sure about this giving thing. I'm not sure about this tithing thing. I'm not sure about serving at this church. I want to tell you something. The miracle only happened in the house of this woman. Not in the houses around it until the houses around it brought their emptiness to the house God's hand was on. That's why the local church is so powerful. There's a teenager in here. God is saying, can I borrow your vessel? But as the disciples, Jesus rolls up on the disciples. They're fishing. Ain't caught nothing all night. They're professional fishermen. And Jesus says, can I borrow your boat? They say, sure, we ain't caught nothing. He says, listen, I want you to take what you think is the right way to do it. And I want you to move that net. I did a study on this. That boat was about six feet wide. They were six feet away from overflow. But they kept doing the same thing. You know what insanity is? It's doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting a different result. And some of you, you're like, man, I'm not giving. It hasn't worked not giving. Maybe it'll work if you sacrifice. Maybe it'll work if you says, God, here it is. Here, I'm living empty-handed. Jesus borrows the boat, and they get so much fish six feet away. <laughs> He says, won't I open up a window and pour so much out that you don't even have room to receive? A live church, I came to tell you that Jesus is a better borrower than me. He never asks for something that he doesn't plan to fill. I came to tell you, if you came in empty, he's going to fill you. If you came in depressed, he's going to fill you. If you came in with anxiety, he's going to fill you. If you came in with doubt, he's going to fill you. If you came in with betrayal, he's going to fill you. If you came in broken, he's going to fill you. You. If you came in suicidal, you are not going to leave empty. Yeah. So he, they, they get behind closed doors. And this woman says, it's all I got. Elisha said, you're not enough. It's just enough. For more than enough. Let me say that again. Somebody say this with me. Say, my not, my not enough. I want you to scream it like you in a Pentecostal church. My not enough, my not enough. is just enough, just enough for more than enough. More than enough. My, not enough my not enough is just enough just for more than enough. More. My, not enough my not enough is just enough just for more than enough. And she... She says, God, this is all I got. He says, pour it. Pour it in the empty vessel. And she pours it into the single mom. And she pours it into the CEO. And she pours it into the white person and the black person and the Hispanic person. She pours it in the rich person. She pours it. And she, it supernaturally keeps multiplying itself. Why? Because there are empty vessels that says, God, if you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Yeah. And I will be content in every circumstance. You are Jaira. You are enough. And this woman went from famine to favor. And she broke 
the generational curse of what her sons were under. Parents, listen to me. I'm telling you, PlayStation and, and Instagram and TikTok and Twitter cannot break a generational curse. I am a living, breathing, walking, talking testimony that church should not be an option for everybody who is in your house. It is time for you to break the generational curse. The Bible says raise up a child in the way that they should go. So when they are old, they will not depart from it. I came all the way to, from West Palm Beach to break the cycle off of your children, to break the stronghold that you've been dealing with. Will somebody stand to their feet and worship like you've never worshiped before? Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, let's lift that hands up. Last one. This house is a house of miracles. Somebody needs to leave. Before you leave, have an attitude that says, I'm not leaving until I get my miracle. I'm not leaving until I get what I came for. If it's confidence, it's available. If it's joy, it's available. If it's fear, God, God's going to move you from fear to faith. I'm telling you right now, I triple dog dare you. Over the next 30 seconds, we're going to sing this song again, and you're going to worship like it doesn't make sense. You're going to praise God like it doesn't make sense. I dare you in our church to raise the roof in this place. I dare you. You are John. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to Alive Online today. I pray that message was a blessing to you. I pray that the Holy Spirit just takes something from it and He illuminates it to where your life will never be the same again. If that's the case, make sure you let us know how your life was impacted and changed because of the message on today. We would love for you to share this content. You know, we have a saying in Alive Church that one invite can change a life. We also believe that one share can change a life. I mean, get your share on. God will use your share as a lifeline to reach people around the world. All right, if you like what we're doing here, we would love for you to be a part of our online family. You can do that by hitting subscribe. We want you to be the first to grab hold of all new messages and all new content as they are released. You know, the Bible says that when we give, It'll be given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And one of the greatest ways that you can make a difference and change lives is by giving. And so if you would like to sow to the ministry of Alive Church, hit the button below. And I know that God will bless you, and you'll also be a blessing to other people. We love you, and we'll see you real soon. God bless you.